Welcome uh, to lecture six, um, where, sorry, start, start that again, we're not in lecture six, we've done lecture six. This is lecture seven, the last of the lectures, and it's going to be in two parts. Um, part one will be on relativism and constructivism, and then part two will be uh, summing up. Okay, so relativism and constructivism, what is there to say? Well, first, relativism is a doctrine about truth. It's a doctrine that says all truth is relativized. So rather than the claim that the earth is flat being just false, absolutely false, rather it's true for some and false for others. Um, and what I want to do in this lecture is to try and show that that relativism has a motivation or gets its motivation from something we all should take seriously. Um, but then I want to show that that motivation actually doesn't fit with relativism, that relativism is a hopeless attempt to respond to that motivation. In the end, what I want to do is to suggest how we should take that um, motivation seriously and how we should respond to that. Um, look, there are views that make knowledge a very widespread phenomenon. Um, each of us will have as much as anyone else and relativism certainly has that consequence. And the thing to remember about relativism, although it can feel as though it's a new and radical thesis is that it's actually not a new view. It's a view that's been around since antiquity. So Protagoras, who was a, a sophist, uh, writing in the 5th century BC, uh, is quoted by Plato as saying, man is the measure of all things. And Plato, when he takes this idea up and discusses it, um, he takes Protagoras to mean, uh, and this is a quote from um, the Theotetus, what seems true to anyone is true for him to whom it seems so. So this is the idea that truth is not absolute, it's relative. Nothing is simply true, but at best it's true for one person and false for another. So for Plato, that relativism is associated with the idea that the truth is what is perceived to be true. And this, and he discusses it under the rubric of knowledge as perception. What you think is true is true. So um, what uh, is true for someone is what they perceive to be true. Now, actually, Plato doesn't just endorse this. He actually criticizes it and thinks that it's woefully wrong. And he actually gives a really interesting argument against relativism. Uh, his argument goes like this. He says... Well, look, the relativist says that what is true is what people think is true. Okay, so what about the fact that most people think relativism is false? It follows from that, according to the relativists, that it is false for them. Um, there's a new twist on that argument that was given by the American philosopher Hilary Putnam. Um, he gave a modern twist to it and he said, well, you say uh, relativism is true. Well, that's fine, but it's not, not true for me. Um, these are interesting arguments to <laughs> run for uh, if you ever come across a relativist because um, they can't quite respond to them very well. And really what we should see that there's a phrase in there that that hides a lot. And that phrase is true for you. Um, it, there is a number of different positions that use that phrase. So, for example, um, when someone says, well, evolution is true for you, that could mean a number of different things. They might mean, well, you believe in evolution, you believe evolution to be true. Or they might mean that, no, evolution is true for you. And um, the first one is uh, 
something we should all just accept if uh, as a way of speaking it's actually saying um, how you believe the world to be that is the truth you form of words there is just indicating that this is what we believe and what we believe is just the same as what we believe to be true not the relativized notion of truth right so nothing here needs to be thought of as relativistic just you, because you believe something doesn't mean it it, it is so uh, and that's quite possible with that view the second view though the view that evolution is true for you where that hyphenated means here is that um, the theory is true but only from your perspective of the world there's no it's really true from your perspective so it's not just that you believe it if you believe it that it is so but it's so from your perspective this is relativism and it's a view that means that there's no objective notion of truth and we're going to spend some time talking about this view below okay so there are these two readings of true for you it it could mean according to you um, or that you believe that or it could mean that the world literally is and not just believed to be like that relative to you the first one that that it's just a which is accounting saying well what do you believe this is what i believe this is perfectly consistent with an absolute notion of truth the second one is not and according to the second it actually makes no sense to talk about absolute truth all there is all the truth there could be is relative truth now the putnam argument and the 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 platonic older version is is based on the aim to show that relativism as a doctrine is actually incoherent that doesn't make sense and actually i don't want to take issue with that claim here um, and not because i think that the plato and putnam are wrong uh, in fact i think they're absolutely right they're they're correct in um, showing up uh, an incoherence in relativism but the issue I want to address is a different one and I think a more pressing one um, because people have shown since Plato that r relativism is incoherent right so if even if a relativism is incoherent and you know we've had over 2,000 years nearly two and a half thousand years of people showing that it's incoherent people are still committing themselves to it so the, the question um, the, the I ask rises out of the fact that there are these relativists all over the place and I want to know what do these people think relativism is a good response to what's their motivation for adopting relativism and what do they think they that relativism as a doctrine is actually doing for them that's the what I want to address and I want to say that I think there is a motivation that people tend to have and it seems to be um, this honorable motivation for of epistemic humility and I think um, um, that idea is really important it's the idea that we think we might be wrong and that the other people we encounter might well be right okay so there's this idea that we should be humble have epistemic humility when we're encountering other people with other views and the threat is um, that if we're absolutists or objectivists about truth then we think we know how things are and whenever we bump into others with different views we're going to arrogantly think that that we know what's right and they're all wrong so the relativists tend to think that the only way to avoid that arrogance is to think that others are right too, right for them. So don't be a, a pos, uh, an absolutist about truth. Be a relativist, accept that they're, they're, what they believe is true for them and uh, you get epistemic humility, it seems to be. That's what the relativist is thinking. And I hope this sounds a bit familiar. If you 
have been um, studying for a while and you will have come across relativists and this should sound like the sort of thing that um, you would hear from them. What I want to show you is that this motivation actually doesn't fit with relativism at all. So let's look closer at the idea of knowledge as something which is a real achievement. Um, this is the idea that not all claims to knowledge are knowledge. And it takes more than thinking something is so to, for it to be so. So remember that phrase, true for you, had a number of different readings. Some were innocent and consistent with being wrong, and some were not so innocent. So what can it mean to say that something is true for you? Well, let's start by noting that a person's beliefs are their map of the world. And that is their map of how things are. So when I have a belief, say a belief that you're not warm-blooded, and uh, I'm, I sincerely believe that, say, then when I say that, I'm saying how things are, according to me. Now, I might be wrong. I might be wrong, in other words, that you know warm-blooded. So the understanding of true for you as consistent with our finding out that I believe that all tuna are warm-blooded and I later found out I was wrong. Right? That's, that's a, a consistent notion of absolute notion of truth, right? So it could turn out that only some tuna are warm-blooded. Understood that way, true for you is just a way of saying what you believe. That is uh, an, a sense of true for you that is consistent with absolute truth and objectivity and it's not a version of relativism okay? but there's another more titillating understanding of the phrase um, that we really have to engage with and this is the idea of getting closer to the relativist or constructivist understanding of the matter and this is the idea that anything you believe really is true for you not just that you believe it it becomes true for you it's not just a way of reiterating that you believe it right the idea is what you believe is true and it's as true as things can be there's no other external notion of truth so there's no absolute notion of truth to aim at all the truth there is is this relative truth Okay, now for simplicity, I'm doing this from an individual perspective, talking about you as an individual, but you can do this um, uh, by focusing on a historical viewpoint or a theory that uh, people share or from a class perspective or whatever. Nothing actually materially changes in the story if you do it that way. So the idea here is that the only notion of truth there is, is this relativized notion of truth, relativized to a perspective, whatever um, types of things share that perspective. And this way, uh, the way the phrase gets used is, uh, fits with the idea of people with different belief systems living in different worlds. But the idea here is that somehow the belief system are constructing these different worlds and that's where the idea of constructivism comes in um, so relative truth constructs worlds that go with those perspectives those belief systems so this idea is then that the construct constructivism is the doctrine that some aspect of our cognitive activity or what our belief systems like constructs the world and importantly different worlds are constructed by different belief systems okay so we have these native belief systems let's you know caricature this um, and we've got a western imperialist belief system the one has spirits and gods in it and the other has money and machines in it um, say and the belief systems are supposed to construct literally different worlds the native doesn't does not just live in the different bit of the same world the westerner lives in 
right? The world the native lives in is not the same world that the Westerner lives in. Okay, so this is the classic constructivist position. All right. And then there's a problem. So you might say, okay, so the constructivist thinks they, they literally live in different worlds, literally different worlds. Well, okay, here's the question. How do they interact? Stephen Stitch, notorious uh, um, uh, bugbear, um, said, um, how come? The imperialists can shoot the native, right? This is our history has been littered with this sort of imperialist uh, violence against natives. How does that happen? If they live in different worlds, how do bullets shift between the worlds, or trinkets, or or booty and artwork, or indeed bodies? How do we do that? Okay, if you ask this question of a relativist or a constructivist, you will get um, the response that you are being stupidly literal. Well, okay, that's true, right? Because they said that they, the native and the Westerner live in different worlds. We're trying to understand the way of talking. So what does it mean? The constructivist might say, well, you know, um, they they can interact. That means they coarsely interact. They affect each other. But it's in that case, they might say, look, it's their ways of conceptualizing the worlds that are different. The thing to note about this, because this is a very common um, backtrack by the, the constructivists. This is the idea that the native and the imperialist have different theories of the world. Not that they live in different worlds. They just have different belief systems about one and the same world. They have different theories about the very same world. This is not the relativist position. Um, this is just the standard position that there's objective truth and that there are different theories about the same world. Okay. Now, but let's take this question of social construction seriously, the idea that things, literally objects, are socially constructed. Look, there are lots of things that really are socially constructed. But being socially constructed does not mean that it's not real. So being objectively true does also not mean that everyone agrees about it. So, for example, the degree that you're studying for is a social construct. The roads that you travel on are social constructs. The money you use to pay for your coffee, that's a social construct. So the clothes you're wearing, so are the bridges over the harbour. They're all social construct, but they're all perfectly real. Sometimes when people um, say that something is a social construct, what, the reason they're saying that is because they're trying to invite the inference that the thing that's a social construct is not objectively real. Well, it just does not follow. The Sydney Harbour Bridge is definitely a social construct, but it doesn't follow that the Sydney Harbour Bridge is not real. The pylons, for example, really are pretty damn solid. And of course, someone might not see it as the Sydney Harbour Bridge, but is seeing it as the Sydney Harbour Bridge part of its being real? There's no reason to think so. In fact, if all the humans disappeared tomorrow and all signs of humanity except for the bridge itself, it would nevertheless survive. And so it would still exist. And even if it disappeared the day after, it did exist. So things don't usually depend on the way they're being conceptualized to exist, right? Not typically. And arguably there are some really rare cases in which really do depend on being seen in certain ways to exist. One of them, um, people have suggested, is national identity. So it's arguable, people have argued, that what's distinctive about our allegiances is that they only exist insofar as we conceive of them as existing. 
Um, and well, I'm a Collingwood supporter. Um, and probably it's true that I'm only a Collingwood supporter um, insofar as I identify as a Collingwood supporter. But actually, it, not all identifications are so straightforward. Is it true that I'm only an Australian insofar as I identify as an Australian? <clears throat> A little bit of autobiography here. I never felt Australian growing up in Melbourne. Melbourne's one of the biggest Greek communities outside of Athens, outside of Greece, right? Um, in fact, if you'd asked me at growing up in Melbourne, um, what was I? I would have said I was Greek. And I felt Greek until I went to study in the US. In fact, in the US, I realized that I was an Aussie. I was an Australian. I wasn't, I didn't fit the image that I had of as an Australian. I wasn't blonde. I wasn't freckled, but I was an Aussie, no less. And notice that when I talk about this, and maybe you've had similar um, realizations, I'm not sure. I'm hoping that the um, cliched picture of what an Aussie is, is not as exclusive as it was when I was growing up. But um, the talk I used here, the words I used was the talking about the discovery. I didn't change my character. I actually found something out about myself. That is, there are things that, are, that can be true about you that you didn't know about yourself. And so there's also some interaction here. There are things you can do to change your character to some extent, right? So if if I'm trying to stop smoking, say, or drinking, or thinking ill of people, I'm actually trying to change the way I relate to the world, change my own dispositions, or change what I want. Right? Um, and this is not something you do in one fell swoop. You know, a simple decision doesn't do it. Changing your dispositions like that is a long-term project, and it's not a matter of one simple decision. Similarly, um, you can find a, a change in your beliefs can make a huge difference to the way you relate to the world. Think about a religious conversion or a, a loss of religious belief. So there's the possibility of actively shaping my own character. Um, and to some extent, this is something that we can do and it takes effort and it takes time. So on the one hand, I can be quite misled about myself, my own nature, my own character. Um, I can perhaps think that I'm a shy, retiring introvert when actually I'm a loud and extroverted person. Um, I can think that the aliens have anointed me as one of the chosen ones, and I might be wrong. Um, maybe I'm an unlucky, a non-chosen one. Another one that's really complicated is sexual identity. There are men who do not identify as homosexual, but who have sex exclusively with men. They would not identify as with themselves as homosexual. They don't think of themselves as homosexual. Um, I'd point out, actually, that most heterosexuals don't think of themselves as heterosexual. Right? Um, being and thinking of yourself as being a certain, having a certain identity are not the same thing here. But <laughs> things are not so straightforward because there are other form sexual identity, which have a different sort of um, conceptual structure. According to many people who identify as queer, to be queer, you have to identify as queer. So that with this form of sexual identity, thinking of yourself as queer is part of being queer. So um, also, to think of yourself as a man or a woman, again, is not a straightforward or simple thing. And there are many ways to be men and women. And what tends to happen is that some few of these are taken as particularly valuable. These are the ones that we identify as the, the valuable versions of being men and being women. 
And what we're doing here is identifying the central cases. If you think about um, the uses of paradigms in the vague concepts like color from the lecture on vagueness, um, you can use it in this connection. In that idea, if you remember, we identified our color concepts by identifying the paradigms of colors and their relationships to other colors. And here we, what we're doing is we're shaping our concepts of a man or a woman by examples that we identify as paradigms. Okay, so there are lots of properties of ourselves that depend on self-description, like being queer or being a Collingwood supporter. And there are others that don't depend on self-description, like being morbidly obese, right? Um, the description that you're morbidly obese can apply to you, even though, like me, you might positively reject it. Um, and also, you might consider um, those who think of themselves as morbidly obese and who are utterly mistaken. Think about people suffering from anorexia nervosa. They look in the mirror and they th think they see an obese person. They're quite mistaken in that. Right? So there are some concepts, some things that are true of us that depend on self-ascribing them, like being uh, a Collingwood supporter or queer. And there are some that don't depend on our self-description, like being obese or anorexic or an extrovert or addicted to coffee. All right. Okay, swapping topics for a moment. What about the dinosaurs? Did we bring the dinosaurs into existence? Well, look, that question um, can be read one way that makes the obvious really, really obvious. The dinosaurs died out, except for the ones that evolved into birds, at the end of the Cretaceous, about 65 million years ago. Humans didn't get on the scene till well over 64 million years after that. So we've been around for about one million years or so, um, not our species, but our genus, so, or things close enough to our species. So unless we time traveled, we did not bring dinosaurs about. Right? We didn't bring this group into existence. But also you might wonder, how do you bring a whole group into existence? Um, the question, did we bring about the dinosaurs, could mean, does the existence of the dinosaurs as a group depend on the way we sort things into groups? So that if we didn't sort them together as a group, they would not exist. Well, this works also with diseases, right? Um, what is it for a disease to exist? Um, do we discover diseases? Do they exist independently? Or... Do we construct them by by grouping cases together? And actually, these two cases are uh, really quite interesting. The idea of classifying um, the natural world and classifying diseases. And actually, I'd say the same thing about both. I think that we discovered the group we call the dinosaurs and we discovered diseases. To see why, I need to say something about... Um, definitions and one other thing. Okay. So I talked about discovery there and I contrasted it with construction. In construction, we create something that wasn't there beforehand. And the idea in discovery is that we find what was there already. That's the, the sort of image to have in mind. And the idea here is that if the dinosaurs are a group, they are so whether or not we identify them as a group. The idea is that there are natural groups in nature and what we're trying to do is identify those natural groups. And um, that's what we're trying to discover when we classify. And if we posit a group as natural as something we want in our class to identify it. And if we're right, it exists. And if we're wrong, even though we've grouped them together, we're wrong. They don't exist as a group. Okay, so let me remind you some features of 
have judgments. Um, an, a, a judgment is a priori if it can be known without examining the world, um, and it's a posteriori if it can be known only with empirical evidence. And this is an important distinction about how we come to know things and how we're liable to go wrong, how um, that works. Definitions are not discovered, right? they're stipulated. Um, we choose to make them true. So we, we do so by, by saying something like, but now we shall use the word blug to mean the same as a very heavy avocado. Right? So when we've said that, when we've done that, um, it's not a discovery that anything which is a blug is a very heavy avocado. After all, that's what it means after that stipulation. And this means that definitions are a priori, not a posteriori. And typically, something is a priori if it's a logical truth or true by uh, definition or a logical consequence of those, logical consequence of uh, logical truths and um, something is true by definition, will also be a priori, since logic, logical consequence is a priori itself. So that means that to know an a priori truth, you don't need evidence. Okay, um, look at this. This was before they discovered him, right? Um, and I, for one, am much comforted by the idea that the experts that were looking for him had such a great grasp on logic. I would have, I would have given them that much information for oh, not very much money. I could have done that. Uh, no one came knocking on my door, but I would have, I would have said that. In fact, I would say that today as well. Um, okay. Um, I want to now put all this together to show you that this, this sort of trivial thing that we've just seen about um, definitions makes a very big difference to how we think about social constructivist stories. Okay, so um, the case of diseases um, is supposed to be a really clear case of social construction and it's commonly held that we socially construct diseases and um, the reason i'm choosing this case is because they are held to be such clear cases and i want to show you that even in this clear so supposedly clear case that the constructivist story is wrong right? so i want to be clear and make a contrast between our theories of disease which are social constructions and the objects of our disease which might not be socially constructed and also and this is the important thing our theories aren't right just because we constructed them socially in fact they could be wrong so how do we think about diseases i want to show that two mundane and obvious truths about how we think about disease rules out the social constructivist story. First, there may be many diseases that we never identify. And some cases that we've group, grouped together um, under a disease, they're in fact not similar, not really similar. They are actually distinct diseases, so that makes sense. And that means that just because we think of two cases as the same disease does not mean that we are right. Okay, so in the case of diseases, we can see that this is right by thinking about the way we actually deal with symptoms. Sometimes people say things that like um, symptoms uh, get described as defining, the symptoms define the disease. But in fact, it's an important mistake to think of symptoms as defining a disease at all. Definitions, remember, have this form, the definiendum and the definiens. The definiendum is the thing getting defined, 
and the Definians is that which defines. So, for example, a, fem a vixen is a female fox by definition. And in set theory, a group is an, a set with an operation on that set. Um, so the two sides of the definition are related a priori. They're, they're not discovered, they're stipulated. Well, we don't discover that groups are sets with an operation on them. We've defined groups to be that. A, a, def, a definition tells us what the definiendum means. And as Kripke reminds us, that's the a, a priori, and the a priori is about knowledge. In particular, it's about knowledge, which is not empirical, not a, priori, uh, not a posteriori. So it's, if, it, in, uh, if, if it's part of the definition and so a priori that all bachelors are male, um, then this is not something that we see is true by dint of empirical evidence. It's not empirical inquiry that shows us that all bachelors are male. Um, the meanings alone of the words sh suffice to show us that the, the, the claim that all bachelors are male is true. With this in hand, now you can see why it's clear to, um, that it's a mistake to think of symptoms as defining a disease. The mundane things that I said about um, diseases earlier um, show how we think about disease. And that shows how we can well understand the possibility of there being cases of the disease that don't show the symptoms, the asymptomatic cases, and cases of people that show symptoms but don't have the disease. Right? So when we think that's possible, we think that's possible that someone has the disease without the, the symptoms and has the symptoms without the disease, that shows that we don't think it's necessary that the symptoms match the disease. Right? They don't necessarily match. Um, they might be um, indicators, but not very good indicators. But even when the symptoms are actually a perfect match for the disease, we, when we found these symptoms and we realize, yes, this is a symptom. If we test for this and you've got this, you've got the disease. That that's something that we don't define to be the case, but we actually discover to be the case. That is, we don't think this is a priori with the idea that we've got this test now for the disease. It's not something we define to be the case. We don't stipulate it. It's actually something that we discover a posteriori. And since the symptoms even in the case where the symptoms are perfect match for the disease, are not associated a priori with the disease, they cannot be a definition of the disease. The relationship between the symptoms and the disease is something we discover empirically. So it's wrong to talk about our socially constructing the disease as we associate symptoms in certain ways of testing with the presence of the disease. So even in this really clear case that the constructivists have argued shows the, the virtues of their approach, their constructivist story is wrong. So let's be clear. Our theories of disease are social constructions, but our theories aren't right just because we socially constructed them. In fact, they could be wrong. And what they are theories of that is what the, the subjects of the, of the theories, the diseases themselves, are usually not socially constructed. And since the objects of disease don't depend on the theory to uh, exist, people can have had the disease and died of the disease long before we developed the theory of the disease. And that's regardless of whether we have ever thought of that theory of that disease. So this is important, right? This is the difference between the, the, develop the disease itself and the development of the theory of the disease. Okay, here's a Rembrandt painting. It's called Bathsheba's Bath by Rembrandt. And it's a very famous painting. Because if you look at 
the um, the pain that the model reports um, that she was his mistress and she was in great pain and the doctors think that the lumpiness under her armpit the, 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 the side of her breast is an indication that she had advanced breast cancer and explain why she was in such pain and why she died. This is before people develop the theory of breast cancer. Moreover, it's not just, you know, recently that cancers have been part of um, the hominin existence. Here is a photo of a bone cancer um, that dates back to 1.7 million years ago. Um, this is the earliest found in our taxonomic group. Um, and that's not just us, right? Um, dinosaurs, um, and sorry, this is an ancestor of the turtle, the stem turtle, which has, uh, an, again, a bone cancer in its left femur. Um, of course, dinosaurs were unlikely to have a theory of, of um, cancer. Um, and we have only recently developed such a theory. Okay, so there's a difference between the theory, developing the theory, and the, the what the theory applies to, the cancers that can extend through time and space. This seems... Kind of obvious right this seems like the sort of thing i shouldn't have to say but there are some constructivists who don't really understand this and one clear example is an influential person bruno latour he's actually sadly influential in the sociology of science um, and Latour objected to the alleged discovery that Pharaoh uh, Ramses II, who died over 3,000 years ago in 1213 BCE, died of tuberculosis. Um, the doctors investigating his mummied remains came to that conclusion. Um, Latour said this had to be mistaken. Right? And he argued this, not because he suggested they'd misidentified the bacillus uh, or that the procedures might have uh, been faulty in some way. Um, no, uh, he didn't argue that it was a late contamination, perhaps, of the body. But he rather he argued that tuberculosis did not then exist. He said, and um, this is a virtual quote, he said that to say that the pharaoh died of tuberculosis is as mistaken as saying that he died by being shot by a machine gun. That's a quote from him. I hope you can see that Latour is simply confused and very, very wrong here. We create theories of diseases and we have the capacity to create um, diseases. And maybe some of them really are our literal creations. They're, the swine flu that came about a few years ago and even COVID, there are theories floating around that these are creations from the lab. And that's possible um, in the case of swine flu which has been investigated, that got squawk, that got quashed. But it's not an impossible theory. Right? Um, too early to say about the COVID virus, but at least most people think that it, that it wasn't. Um, we'll see what more evidence shows about that. And it's certainly not a mad theory, right? We have got the capacity, after all, to create these diseases. 
But the mad theory is the Latourian theory, that it's the idea that naming something is to create it. And um, Latour misses this distinction that between inventing theories without thereby inventing their objects. Our theory of tuberculosis is much, much more recent than the objects that theory is about. So, our, so by the way, are our theories of dinosaurs, right? Um, did he balk at the idea of, of describing something as a dinosaur because dinosaurs did not then exist, <laughs> you know? Um, the, the idea that to name something is to create it is a version of bizarre linguistic idealism. But in that case, if you think about it, we can't have two names for the same thing. For that would be two distinct creations. And we, you'd suppose they'd be two distinct things. So Latour's confusion shows that that naive question that Stephen Stitch asked about the imperialist shooting the native was which was supposed to be um, stupidly literal, said the constructors, actually is not beside the point at all, but actually really pertinent. Um, what do you mean? So, in sum, what we should say is that we develop theories, we build things, and the native and the Westerner share a world, but disagree about it. Say they have, they have um, different theories. Right, The bullets are in the native's world, just like the Westerners' world, but they're not in the theory of um, the native. The world is not the same thing as their theory is the world. But the same goes for us too. Our world and our theory of the world are two distinct things. That's why we can be wrong about the world. Let's go back then to that relativism and its and its motivation. Remember the motivation that I said was a good one that people were trying to respond to. And that motivation was be a little humble. Don't think you're always right and others are always wrong. All right. I think this idea of being humble, of having epistemic humility, this is a really sensible notion. I think we should take it very, very seriously. And some people think that in meeting other cultures, we would do better if we were epistemically more humble and didn't ass assume we were right. Okay, so I think epistemic humility is important. Then what? Well, some of these people think, who think epistemic humility is important, that um, the way to get there is to assert that that other culture has beliefs that are true for them, even though their beliefs are not true for us. That is, they assert a relativism about truth as a way to deliver epistemic humility. The other's beliefs are true for them, and so they suggest these beliefs aren't to be dismissed simply because they differ from your own beliefs. Okay, okay but this is where the big but comes in. It's real. This is a really confused position. In fact, by denying that there is any objective truth and making true for me and true for you all that there is, all that you can aspire to, the relativist actually undermines epistemic humility. Why should I, if I'm a relativist, be epistemically humble? All my beliefs are as true as they could possibly be. They're all true for me. And since all my beliefs are true for me, why should I be humble? I can't be wrong from their relativist perspective. So far from being a way of capturing the idea of epistemic humility, the relativist has actually undermined any reason you might have had to be epistemically humble. The relativist has undermined the idea that I might be wrong. If I believe something, then it's true for me, and that's as true as things get. So why be humble? 
So let's think again about this idea of epistemic humility. Remember the idea that I might be wrong. I might be wrong means at least this, that it's possible that I think the world is one way and it's in fact another way. To make sense of that, I need the notion of an objective world, a world which can be a way I don't think it is. Right. So it looks like to make sense of epistemic humility, the idea that we might be wrong, we are best off um, requiring that. So we it requires the idea of a world whose character can be independent of whatever I believe about it. So to make sense of epistemic humility, the thing that I think is a, a good idea, epistemic humility, we are best off as being realists in this particular sense. We believe in a world whose character is independent of our cognizing. And incidentally, when we talk about our meeting others with different views, part of what we mean is that both views cannot be true. That they have a logical relationship to each other. But the relativist makes both of us right. Another problem with relativism is it makes that there are no logical relations between the different belief systems. They don't contradict each other and they don't agree with each other either. They're just different belief systems. They're about different worlds. So there are literally no logical relations between the, the different belief systems. And part of the motivation for relativism was the idea um, that it might, that it, in meeting other cultures, we might turn out that they know some stuff that we don't, that we were wrong and they were right. So relativism is utterly hopeless. Not just that it's confused in the way that Plato and Putnam argued, which I think it is, but it actually doesn't fit with what it's supposed to be its own motivation. <coughs> Our best reason to be epistemically humble is to think that there's a world independent of us in which we in others who have different ideas are living in. And to think that we know something is not the same thing as thinking that we are certain. To be a fallibilist about knowledge is to acknowledge the objectivity of the world that we live in and our fallible ways of coming to know. It's because we all live in the same world, the very same world, that we stand to learn from others who might have different beliefs. End of part one. I'll see you in part two, where we finish this course of lectures.